Hi, and welcome to Magic Numbers. This is episode number 38. And today I'm going to be talking about the best of three drafting, which is slightly different than best of one. And um, we're going to focus on those differences um, and briefly chat about the similarities. We're going to look at which cards excel in best of three uh, and which cards are most used as sideboard cards and which of those cards are actually useful as sideboard cards, according to the data, at least. Um, Obviously, the similarities between the best of three and best of one formats in the same set are quite large. So hopefully we're in for a sweet and short episode um, as, I, as I might have exposed you to quite a lot of magic content this week with my uh, appearance on the limited resources that was again, very long. So um, apologies for that, but okay. My preamble for this week, this is a short segment of punditry I do at the beginning of every seminar just to warm me up and also just to give you maybe some background of something that just happened or something that I think links well to the episode. And today I want to talk that to be a better player, play best of three more frequently. And I think best of three in draft will improve you on multiple um, on multiple uh, in multiple categories. So first of all, it is more like what you would expect to have in bigger tournaments. So if your plan is to grind something in paper, you'd rather be focusing on best of three because best of one is really, really different from best of three. And uh, if you get used to best of one, you might not. it might not be super simple for you to adjust to playing best of three. And one notable thing, and we're going to focus, of course, on all those differences and similarities, is the lack of hands moving algorithm, which will mean that you will mulligan much more frequently and which will mean that um, some types of decks are going to perform much worse in uh, best of three, like speculatively, at least um, aggressive decks are not working as well because best of one gives them the ability to um, get this perfect curve out and uh, best of three very frequently will either flood you or uh, you'll have mana screw or a color screw and um, you won't be able to play as much magic as uh, you normally would in best of one. Uh, this is the strength of best of one. It just basically limits the number of non-games because um, smoothing algorithm works in such a way that you will always get a hand that has at least theoretical capability of casting spells. and. Best of three doesn't give you that kind of a guarantee, and that's a big, big issue. But best of three has other points, and um, you know I'm not going to be looking at this uh, from the data perspective because that's very personal uh, ability and very personal skill. But sideboarding is absolutely essential, and you know good players will sideboard out lands when it's uh, beneficial for them, sideboard in lands when it's beneficial for them, change the speed of the deck, get some of those bigger sideboarding transformations that will go from sort of mid-range deck to more aggro deck, or maybe from mid-range deck to more controlish deck, um, depending on what you have in your pool uh, and depending on the matchup that you're dealing with. So um, um, it's worth learning those things and best of one will not give you that ability. So uh, I think to be a more complete Magic the Gathering player, I think best of three is the format that you want to uh, be paying attention to at least. But of course, we are all restricted with time and that's why most of the people play best of one because it's just quick to start a game, finish it in 15 minutes and not have to be worried that uh, it might turn into a one hour um, best of three match when it's two one and uh, uh, yeah. So explore more best of three if you don't, because it will give you skills that you won't acquire playing only best of one. So just to give you the data summary, I looked at the 17 lens public data. I took the data set from uh, 7th of May to the 23rd of May, because that's when the public data set ends. Um, and it's around 10,000 drafts in best of three and 77,000 games. And this is also uh, around 300,000 games in best of one when I did comparison between the two formats. And of course, I didn't put it in the slide. And I knew that I'm not going to put it in the slide once I made this gap because I knew that I'm going to forget it. But hey, that's what happened. 
Um, so, as I was speaking in the preamble, there are many general differences. The most important one is no hand smoothing in best of three, which leads to increased mulliganing, and we're going to look at the data for that. Uh, there is the sideboarding, which is a very useful skill in Magic and very underappreciated one in Limited, especially by the generation that was raised on best of one play. Um, and Another thing that is um, different in best of three on Arena, especially, is that the draft pot strength is different from best of one. So generally, your average draft pot will have stronger players. However, the average player ability that you're going to play against is going to, well, very much depend on where you are on the skill progression level. If you're a beginner player or if your win rate is pretty low, then playing best of three will mean that you're going to meet much, much stronger uh, opponents than you would meet on the ladder if you are, you know, in the uh, silver, gold, uh, maybe, maybe you know, like late month platinum kind of tier of, of players. This means that uh, in best of three, you're going to meet much stronger players. However, if you're the, you know, mythic player that hits mythic regularly, um, you probably are going to play against weaker players than you played in best of one because there is no matching based on um, uh, based on rank like it is in best of one. So you might be playing with people that um, would be in bronze to silver in your best of three games. And it will very rarely only happen when you are playing best of one. So um, uh, it's sort of like very dependent on where you yourself are. But uh, depending on your skill, you're going to be either meeting weaker players than normally or stronger players than normally. Um, and we're going to look at, uh, because I made this claim, draft put strength varies and the stronger drafters are in um, best of three, but um, possibly you want some proof for that statement. So we're going to focus on it uh, in a second. But what do we have here? So first I wanted to look at the core preferences because Except for differences in the gameplay and um, in who is on the pods, you might have some minor differences between uh, best of one and best of three in terms of uh, what people play. And I looked first at the preferences in terms of numbers of colors played. And um, as you can see, best of three players will tend to play a bit less of the best of the three color decks. Uh, it's not a big difference for a percentage point, but it is a difference nonetheless. Uh, this will mean that they will more likely lean on the two colors and splash. If you listen to the limited resources, I made a lengthy argument why I think that um, Streets of New Capena is a three color format. And <laughs> to be fair, I'm probably um, well very alone in my quest of uh, trying to uh, convince people that this is a three color format. But uh, you know, I do have good results myself, and I predominantly play three color decks. One thing that I don't want to play is the two colors and splash because, um, well, in some color combinations, I think it's very risky to play two colors and splash, uh, especially in Maestros, uh, because of the self mill uh, that will lead to you losing the cards that you uh, need for fixing of that last uh, splash color. Um, but there is no big differences in playing two color decks and three colors and splash. So majority of the difference between those two formats. Oh, <laughs> that's a very good thing. I didn't hide the comment because of my, I see my uh, presentation only in the um, small window. Um, AJ Mirowski. So yeah, the majority of the difference between um, between the best of one uh, 17 lens user decks and the best of three 17 lens user deck is slightly lower prevalence of those three color decks and slightly higher prevalence of those three colors in splash decks. Um, in terms of color combinations, uh, when you look at the two color combinations uh, with or without splash, I uh, sort of put them together. Um, you see that um, this adds to 100% uh, for the two color combination. So obviously um, uh, it's not all the decks, you know, the 33% of the decks in uh, best of one are not Azorius, but 33% of two color combination decks are Azorius in, in, in the format. So um, 
in both best of one and best of three, Azorius is the most color, popular color combination with the 17 lens users. This is in stark contrast to, I think, 17 lens opponents who, who play Azorius much less frequently. So um, this is a sort of measure of the investment of a player. Like more invested players will know that Azorius is the place to be and they will play it. However, in best of three, as I said, the pods are slightly stronger. So it means that you probably will not as frequently have an open Azorius lane um, uh, to go through, which means that uh, there is a slight decrease of frequency of playing Azorius in best of three. It's 33% of the two color decks in uh, best of one and around 29% in best of three. At the same time, people play Demir much more frequently. So uh, it was 13% in best of one and 15% in best of three. So that's where the gains are um, uh, to replace those times when you cannot play Azorius. You probably, you know, I think that the easiest path to get onto the Azorius decks is uh, start with blue because that keeps you open for multiple combinations. And I guess that's what people are doing. And sometimes they white just doesn't happen to be open. So uh, they switch to the second best thing, uh, which is black. And they, they, they do tend to be more frequently in those Demir decks probably because of that. And there's very little difference between um, uh, in, in Ragdos frequency and Gruul frequency. There's like a small difference, but it's probably not important. And Selesnya and all the other combinations are played around 3.5% in both formats. So uh, they are playable. Uh, I mean, 3% of 3.5% uh, of the two color decks are outside of the uh, neighboring colors and uh, are played in the enemy ones. So something maybe worth thinking about when uh, when you're drafting that you are not restricted to um, to your um, neighboring colors. If you find a lane to play Orzov or Simic, I think these two were performing quite well in terms of numbers. They don't come together frequently, but they are they can be powerful. So uh, keep an eye open for those. But there is no difference between best of one or best of three, how frequently you can get on them. Um, when it comes to the three color combination preferences with or without splash again, um, there is no difference in Obscura decks. They are played in the same frequency around 19%. Around 20% of the decks are Maestros. So <clears throat> these are the numbers that you would expect to see more or less from the uh, frequency of the five three color combinations that are the what, designed ones. So both Ob Obscura and Maestros are sort of like how you would expect them if the format was balanced. And here where the imbalance comes in, uh, Riveteers are played around 10% of the time and Cabaretti around 13-14% uh, of the time. Slightly more frequent both of those decks in um, best of three. Um, so there's a, like a one percentage point difference of in Riveteers and there is a slightly bigger difference in Cabaretti. So if those are overrepresented, this means one thing. Uh, brokers are slightly less played in uh, best of three. Again, I will lean on that uh, assumption that people on in your pod in best of three are on average slightly better. So um, this means that uh, brokers are going to be slightly more contested. And because brokers are going to be slightly more contested, uh, you will probably have to land on those uh, theoretically weaker strategies um, some amount of the time at least. So it's around 38% of the time uh, brokers are being played as um, in best of one in terms of three color decks being played and 35% of the time in best of three. So two, three percentage points difference. And other decks, uh, different combinations, Jeskai or uh, Sultai are almost not played. So it's like half percent, 0.3% of the time um, in best of one and best of three um, respectively. And I don't know. I don't know if it's a good thing because Fixing is there to play Jeskai, for example. So um, uh, if uh, some people have uh, experienced good um, three color, that's wedges, I guess, three color wedge decks, um, then uh, please, by all means, tweet them and uh, tag me into them because I'm very curious about uh, interesting uh, Jeskai builds, for example. Because I think Fixing is there to play them. Um, cards are probably there to play them because you can play sort of Azorius with red. Um, it's just maybe people are a bit worried about playing them. And um, if there are 
those among you who are not worried about playing Jeskai, then um, yeah, it will be interesting to see. Now, uh, this is just the trophy rate. So how many wins do you get per draft on average um, in matches? Because you have to keep in mind that when I talk about best of one, it's just when one games are one matches, it doesn't really change anything. Here, the match win rate is around 57%. Uh, which is slightly lower than uh, normally for the 17 wins users, but also then best of one, uh, the win rate for the games is around 54.6 or 8 uh, in the same time frame that I'm analyzing for the best of three. Um, so, um, yeah, basically 12% of the um, uh, uh, drafts end up in OX. Uh, and most of the time, I think in this case, O3, because uh, they change the award payoffs, and because of the award payoffs change, um, it's worth playing out this last game because you can get a couple of gems at least for that. So that's fine. Um, hey, just Lola Man and Metal Mario, nice to see you. Um, oh, I don't have Twitch open in any kind of window. Did I did, did I get raided or or something? because then I have to say thank you. Okay. No, possibly not, but still nice seeing you. Oh, it was it a big raid from Lola. Okay. Oh yes, there is a big raid. <laughs> Thanks uh, just Lola man for the raid. That's uh, phenomenal. Uh, you just came in. Thank you very much and enjoy your free time. Uh, um, but thanks for the raid. Now I have to refine my presentation. There we go. Um, for the raiders, I'm just going to give you a very brief update. Um, I didn't talk much so far. I looked at some differences in color preferences. Basically, in best of three people play a bit less three color, a bit more two color decks. Um, they play a bit less Azorius and a bit more Dimir and Gru, uh, and they play a bit less Brokers and a bit more Cabaretti and Riveteers, which I think is linked to the fact that um, best of three draft pods are filled with people that are a bit more hardcore drafters. So uh, your average draft pod will have better players, which means that they know that Brokers is the best combination and it will be a slightly more challenged in the draft. And basically, 12% of your of average 17 lens user drafts will be OXs. Around 28% will have one win. And then 40% uh, are two ones and 20% are three O's. Not for just Lola Man. For just Lola Man, probably those numbers look very, very differently. I would assume 45% trophy rate, if I would be guessing. I don't know his stats for this season uh, by heart, but. Uh, that's what I would guess. That's why you're watching uh, uh, just Lola Man and um, uh, and learning how to play from him, which is, I think, a great way of improving your game. So I told you that um, I think that the pods in best of three are stronger than the pods in best of one. So I did a couple of analyses to try to prove it and hopefully um, hopefully, after you see it, you you'll be convinced that uh, indeed, indeed, um, uh, it is the case. So here I have a list of cards, and these are not random cards. I didn't select them at random. These are the fifteen or so um, cards that changed in their evaluation by the most during the first ten days of format. So what I did was. Um, um, Yes, AJ Morosky, that would be exactly, I think that that would be the exact number, I think, yes. So it's uh, definitely there is uh, more trophying and slight decrease in the one twos based on the 57% win rate rather than 50% win rate. I didn't calculate what it should be. I probably should have. 
But okay, these 15 cards are not um, random. These are the cards that change in the evaluation of uh, 17 lens user by the most during the first 10 days. So um, it means that these are the cards that maybe people started a bit lower on and then quickly it became apparent that they are strong. And um, um, when it became that they are strong, of course, people adjusted their pick orders and were picking them slightly higher. So this is the ALSA day, um, data from the first three days. For those of you that don't know what ALSA is, ALSA means average last seen as, and it's a measure of how late do you see a card in the, uh, in the draft on average. So if a card has ALSA one, it means that you only see it as a first pick. And that will be like super bombs, like I don't know, Elspeth, for example. You, you People open Elspeth, they pick it because it's better than anything in the pack most of the time, or pr practically all of the time. Which means, and also it's a, like a collectible thing for constructed or, um, or, or, you know, it's a mythic rare. So you will rarely see it being passed further. Um, and, you know, if a card uh, has also a free, that's still a highly picked card, but you will see it sometimes as a first pick, sometimes as a second pick, sometimes as a third, you know, on occasions it will go fourth and fifth, um, which means that, you know, this is the card you will see slightly later in the draft. And, you know, like things that have an ALSA of 10 or something, that means that these are the cards that no one picks and you just basically can wheel them almost every single time. So um, uh, that's the numbers. And, you know, most commons are doing this uh, 5 to 7, 5 to 8 uh, kind of ALSA range. So these are those 15 cards that uh, increased in the evaluation the most, but I'm only showing you the data for the first three days. So that's where people started the, with the evaluation of those cards. And you can see that even in here, we can see that the red uh, bars are the um, evaluation of the best of one average player and uh, blue are the uh, evaluation of the best of three average player. We still see that best of three players were quite a, a bit higher on several of those cards uh, from the get-go. So uh, we see Make Disappear, Rafin's Informant, people were a bit higher on those um, uh, in best of three. Backup Agent is another card that they were picked a bit earlier in, in, in best of uh, three. Same goes for Majestic Metamorphosis and the quick um, draw dagger, uh, Echo Inspector, uh, Gathering Throng, all those cards were slightly uh, picked slightly higher, you know, the lower the number, the higher it's being picked um, by the best of three players. We also see uh, Run Out of Town and Rooftop Nuisance and Sparrow's Adjugators uh, being picked slightly higher in best of three. So even, you know, at the first three days, um, uh, the best of three players evaluated a uh, majority of those cards a bit higher, but not all of them. Um, best of one players were higher on the Sky Crier. Uh, they were higher on Revelation of Power for the family, uh, Security Bypass. And there is a slight theme there, um, except for Skycrier, most of those things are some kind of uh, creature mm, creature boosting cards. Uh, so there's a couple of combat tricks, there's one aura there. Um, and I think that A, those cards maybe are slightly better in best of one than in best of three, but B, maybe also the, the, the best of one kind of player will be um, higher on, on, on combat tricks in general, because in best of three, you know, you play the combat trick in game number one. In game number two, uh, the opponent is going to play on that trick. So they lose, you know, at least a bit of that equity that uh, you don't lose in best of one games. Uh, but it's important to see, it's interesting to see how those things change. I told you that best of three players, in the hypothesis at least, and, you know, I had some data from previous sets that sort of mildly suggests that uh, this might happen. Um, those better invested players should be also quicker to react when uh, format changes. And um, when we look at um, the data from the you know roughly ten days that the format has been uh, lasting, you see that most of those cards now, almost all of them, in fact, are uh, picked higher by the best of three drafters. And uh, it, it, even if there were slight differences, those differences are now quite quite large between the, the, uh, between, the uh, between how it's being evaluated in best of one and best of three. So if we go back by one slide, you see that the Make Disappear was almost equally evaluated in best of one players by best of one players and best of three players uh, at uh, also of uh, 7.6 roughly. Um, 
the ALSA for uh, best of one is now 6.6, .6, but the ALSA for best of three is 5.7. So there was a massive uh, uh, change in the evaluation of this card in the first 10 days in both formats, but um, in best of three, the, the change was much more dramatic. And you know, Rafin's informant is more uh, valued um, um, in uh, best of three. Skycrier was slightly uh, highly higher picked in best of one uh, in the first three days of the format, but give 10 days for people to evaluate what's happening in the format. And now it's better valued in best of three. Mm, same backup agent, uh, metamorphosis, quick draw dagger, revelation of power, again, another card that was uh, evaluated more highly in uh, best of uh, one, now is uh, evaluated more highly in best of three. And all of those cards are basically with the exception of security bypass uh, are valued slightly higher now in the best of three after those 10 days. Which means that in the first 10 days, people that play best of three are paying more attention to content creators. Uh, they jump on the hype trains for the good or for the bad, but you can see that those players are slightly more invested and they update their pick orders more aggressively. So this is, and uh, yeah, so here I um, I show you also the delta uh, of ALSA. So basically, um, how much it changed over um, over those uh, first ten days. And again, in most cases, except for very few, where Rafin's informant has almost the same kind of change uh, in pick evaluation over the um, first um, uh, first ten days. But in majority, I think barring maybe Gathering Throng and uh, Rooftop Nuisance. Uh, my camera is covering the card. Yeah, it's Make Disappear, which is ironic because my camera made it disappear. Um, so yeah, Make Disappear is the card on the complete left. Um, this one was, I mean, no one came pretty high on that card early format, but it quickly proved to be Oh yeah, why 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 is the comment still there? Uh. Huh. Weird. I didn't even want to put the comment in. But anyway, um, as you can see, the, the the best of three players update their pick orders more dramatically, which means that um, and it doesn't only you know um, apply to the seventeen lens user because ALSA is a measure that looks at all the users because. All the users take part in your pods, and um, uh, it's calculated based on the non-17 land users as well, which means that even the non-17 land users that are drafting best of three are slightly more invested and are slightly more willing to change their um, card evaluation. So um, this is an interesting piece of data for one thing. If you want to get used to draft in slightly more competitive pods, then you probably should do it in the best of three. I mean, of course, the best thing is to just find eight people and draft in a competitive eight people pod uh, outside of the arena system. But if you don't have that kind of option, I think that um, if I would be working on my drafting skills, I would probably start drafting best of three. Uh, and focus on getting good decks, not even focusing on how well do they do, um, because that's not the point, but I would try to draft the best deck. I would try to um, share my draft logs with content creators that specialize in you know, draft log reviewing, you know, spend those channel points or uh, give away those um, um, uh, subs. And, um, and uh, basically, this will improve your drafting more rapidly than um, uh, than um, than drafting in best of one. Do seventeen lens users have higher win rates in best of one or best of three? Across almost every single format, it is higher in best of three by around three to five percentage points, and this is because I told you that the draft pods are more competitive in best of three, but uh, best of three is not ranked, which means that after you finish playing your draft, you're going to be matched with a random uh, person. And in best of one, you're not going to be matched with a random person, but most likely you're going to be matched against someone who is in the same 
uh, rank as you are. So if you're in diamond, you're going to play a diamond player. Or if you're diamond level player in best of three, you might uh, easily play a bronze player, which, um, which of course will put you very much favored there because uh, a bronze level player will probably didn't play as much as you, so they might not have all the skills that you accrued over your you know years of grinding. So uh, that's why this is the sort of paradoxical thing that best of three has better draft pods, but if you are a very good player. It, you will have weaker opponents. If you are a beginner player in best of three, you probably will have uh, much stronger opponents than you will get in best of one uh, when you're playing. So that might be you know, a bit off-putting if you are going to um, uh, lose a lot because you just get paired with the JSON um, ILTG all the time in best of three. And uh, well, no one wants to have that kind of thing happen to them, including myself. JSON is very good short um so yes so the opponent quality offsets the tougher um draft pods i mean they're so tougher draft pods, draft pods with better players it doesn't mean that they're necessarily tougher i sometimes do prefer to draft in uh, a pod where the level is quite high because they are slightly more predictable. So if I know that I'm with uh, seven other players that know what's going on, I have clearer signals because I can expect them to do particular things and predict them better. If I have unknown um, skill level players, they might do some things that will be wildly bemusing to me, but I have to read their signals. It's it's sort of like, I don't know, there's this uh, thing when 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 rookie players play poker that sometimes they just win because they do some inconceivable things that uh, an, a, a seasoned pro poker player will not predict to happen because they were just crazy to do in the first place. And of course, you know, in 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 thousands of games, the, the seasoned um, poker player is going to completely strip uh, all the money from that kind of a uh, rookie player. But in particular games, it might be quite beneficial for the rookie player because they do something really completely out of whack and uh, they get lucky on whatever the river and, uh, and, and and win a hand that they didn't have any reason to be in in the first place. So, yeah. Um, so th this is the same kind of thing with good pods when um, the predictability is useful because if you know how to read information, you, you can read more information from a predictable pod because there is a bit less noise there. Um, but the uh, opponent quality is might be slightly lower if you are a high uh, level player because obviously no matchmaking based on rank uh, will will cause that. Right. Okay, let's move. move let's move on. So this is the important thing. I'm very much against mulliganing in best of one. Um, and uh, I'm not the only one. These are the mulligan rates for best of one and best of three. And in best of one, it's 11.4%. Uh, in best of three, it's 19.4%. Now, I don't play enough best of three to evaluate if the 19.4% is the right or maybe too high rate of mulliganing. I do know almost for sure that 11.4 um, is way too high a mulligan rate for uh, best of one. I did some calculations from previous sets and it was mm, around optimum to be mulliganing six to 8% of the time uh, based on if your deck is built properly, that's how often you should get an absolutely atrocious hand that you would have to uh, Court smooth rate was 2%, wasn't it? Or 3.4, I think. Um, yeah, hand smoother goes a long way if you build your decks right. If you build your decks right, the hand smoother will almost but eliminate uh, um, uh, um, um, yeah. yeah, good deck building will, will, will limit it. Um, hi, uh, R. Castiello. Uh, Thanks for liking my content. I do appreciate it. Was it you that wrote about the uh, Salmorejo in the Twitter thread, uh, or or do I mis 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 misremember things?
Uh, maybe not. No, because um, the, because I was talking about Spanish soups on um, on limited resources for some unbeknownst to me reason. Uh, oh, thanks for the rate. Uh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry, I, I can't see who rated me, but uh, oh, that's a really neat rate. Also, congratulations on on, on qualifying for the arena championships. Um, well, hope hopefully hopefully listening to um, listening to some of my content did m minor help to to uh, to that success. No, 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 that's fine. That's fine. I hope your stream went well. Uh, we were just talking about slight differences between best of three and best of one, and we. We talked about the difference in the pods, and basically I showed that the pods are um, stronger in best of three. So if you want to improve your drafting in strong pods, I would suggest practicing in best of three if you don't have the option of practicing, you know, with with your friends. And now we're talking about how learning how to mulligan. And I told that best of one, you basically shouldn't mulligan unless it's really something atrocious, which can happen, but um, uh, rarely. 11.4% uh, mulligan rate looks too high to me. Um, but in non hand smoothing environment of best of three, I think it's a good moment to learn how to mulligan properly. Because if you play best of three, you really have to uh, make sure that you mulligan the right hands because it won't be as easy as in the best of one when uh, you will always get at least two lands, probably three lands most likely. Um, you will have a full range of getting zero landers to five, six landers, things that almost never happen in uh, best of one. I think when I did my hands moving um, episode of this seminar and I analyzed the uh, what happens when the hands moving uh, is done, I think in best of one, you get a zero land hand once every 500,000 hands. Um, so that's quite rare. And in best of one, it will happen once every 50, maybe maybe 70 hands. So it will happen free, much more frequently than you would expect uh, in, in best of three. That's why the hands moving is such a powerful tool for uh, helping non-games from uh, stopping non-games from happening. So you will see much more of the real magic. Um, and if you are planning to play in paper, and if you um, are playing in paper at high level, you better learn how to mulligan correctly. And best of one, it will not give you that skill. I think that best of three is going to be uh, uh, the best way to practice. I'm pretty sure that 19.4 um, um, 19 is probably still the high, too high uh, for a mulliganing rate. People, People play safe and they are worried too much uh, and they mulligan slightly, I think, too much in, in general. <clears throat> okay. So I also tried to look at the play to draw advantage in best of three. And I took all the games uh, that you people were on the play and all the games that people were on the draw. And I found this amazing number that uh, actually... You have a higher uh, win rate in best of three when you are on the draw. And this is maybe a bit of a lesson in looking at data. Um, I could have looked at it and said, ooh, wow, maybe I should make um, um, a big Twitter thread about how you should be on the draw in best of three. Um, but I also had uh, those alarm bells ringing uh, that this is a weird result. Maybe I should take a look at it with a bit of more granularity. And that's why there is this big false sign on, on, on this graph, uh, because I think that this graph, if I would publish it, the numbers would be true, but the conclusions would be absolutely, utterly wrong. Um, uh, and, and here's why. Um, I took the same data and I looked at um, the win rate on the player and on the draw in each of the games of the match. Um, and what what is striking is that you're winning way more um, uh, games on the play uh, than on the draw in game one. It's like 59% win rate um, on the play and 67-ish uh, win rate, percent win rate on the, on the um, draw. 
And then in game two, something incredible happens. And uh, the win rate on the play in game two is 53%. And the win rate on the draw in game two is 62.2. And this is why uh, the general win rate on the draw is higher than the win rate on the play. It's not that uh, because uh, it's beneficial to be on the draw. It's because in game two, if you won the first game, you're going to be always on the, on the draw. And very often, because of how the matchmaking works, it means that you're playing against a weaker player. If you're a 17 lens user and you're playing against someone that's just uh, trying out uh, and trying to figure out how best of three works, which means that you are very much favored in that game, even though you're on the draw because you already won the first game. And uh, that means that your deck is probably also stronger. Um, uh, so you are uh, favored to win this game and that creates this imbalance. Uh, while of course, if you're on the play in game number, um, in game number uh, two, that means you lost the first game, which means that opponent is probably having a pretty strong deck already because they managed to win with you in the game one. And that also decreases your win rate, which means that um, uh, there is this weird uh, imbalance. So um, to look at whether it's beneficial to be on the play or on the draw in um, best of one, also like, um, people play way, 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 way more games um, in game two on the draw in uh, the 17 men's users. So there is also this number, this imbalance. That's what pointed me to finding the uh, the real reason for, for, the, for the result of the first graph. Because people that use 17 lands, they win 57% of the games. And if they win 57% uh, of the games, they will be more frequently on the draw in game two just by nature because uh, uh, well because they, they are more likely to win their first game um, independently of the result of the who starts in the first game. So if you want to look at what is the play and draw advantage by the um, uh, in the best of three, you should only look at the statistics from game one because these statistics are unbiased. You have 50% of the game on the play, 50% of the games on the draw, because uh, just like shuffling uh, is not um, in any way, um, you know, skewed, as some people suggest, shuffler conspiracists are wrong. If there would be a coin flip conspiracist, and I'm sure that there are somewhere, uh, it's almost exactly 50% of the games that the 17 lens users um, uh, win the coin flip and lose the coin flip uh, to start. So we have this uh, we have this nice uh, data set there, which is not biased for the number of the games and which is not biased by the result of the previous game. So the first game will give you a, a, a true picture of what is the play draw advantage. And the second game is already biased because of several confounding factors that I told you being more frequently on the draw, playing more frequently with the decks that are poorer when you are on the draw and whatever. Uh, so I guess that the 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 the, the important news is uh, you are in advantage when you're on the play. So you should, if you have a choice, you should be choose to be on the play if you're playing on paper in paper, and that's by around um, uh, two two point five percentage points uh, uh, basically. Now I did it for the previous format. I didn't do it for this format, but. Uh, there is ways of calculating uh, whether your deck um, should be on the play or on the draw. And in the previous format, I did calculate that approximately 13% of the decks actually would prefer to be on the draw. I uh, don't know how it is in this one, but it would be maybe good to jump in into that in best of one and, uh, um, and, and try to see. Uh, MTG Diversity asks, uh, how much does th this difference vary between different formats? It's, from my experience, I think the smallest difference was uh, in Terra's Beyond Death, which maybe is something that you might consider as this is going to be the premier draft format of the next couple of weeks um, as, a, as a returning format. And there, there was uh, practically no difference between being on the play and being on the draw. Uh, so, uh, so yeah, uh, don't, uh, don't despair when you don't win the coin flip. Um, 
because uh, Terrace is one of those formats where being on the play does not give you that big of an advantage because of how many ways to grind you had in that format. That's probably one of the reasons why I was absolutely rubbish, unlike Metal Mario, who is excited. I was rubbish in Terrace. I'm still going to play it because I'm curious uh, to see if I'm still rubbish. But probably after three drafts and, and con convincing myself, confirming that I'm still rubbish in it, I'm going to uh, give it a break. It's not a bad format, by all means. It was just I'm not good in that format. It's uh, I think it was an interesting format to play, but didn't click with my game style. Um, uh, so, you know, I can explore it. I, I don't necessarily want to punish myself with playing it and, and losing continuously. And interesting uh, part of that, um, um, oh, Springbook is asking, what is my game style? Um, first of all, I'm not a very careful player, so I make mistakes. So longer games are not promoting me because I will always punt something. And second of all, I am more into building synergistic decks and trying to abuse the synergies within them. And I think Theros was more like nickel and diming opponent by uh, accruing small, uh, you know, not two for one, but you know, maybe 1.3 uh, for one uh, kind of advantage. And I'm really bad in that kind of game because I learned how to play in the deep 90s and then I stopped playing in around 2005. And I think that after the time that I stopped, uh, the style of the game changed dramatically and all the mid range started to be born more or less in that time between 2005 and 2015. Um, all those uh, people like you know Brad Nelson or uh, all the mid-range players, basically uh, now called boomers, from, also by me, which is weird because I'm older than them. Um, they developed this uh, particular game playing style because of the sets that were in there, where when you basically accrue those small um, values. But this is a gameplay style that requires almost immaculate uh, technical play uh, to work for you. And I was more like high variance uh, moments, moments of genius, moments of dumbness kind of uh, kind of player. And uh, Terrace with its requirement for consistency was not really solving my game style. That's a very nice digression from the main topic. Um, um, so one thing to notice is that there is still a, a, a being on the play advantage in game three, uh, but you generally lose more in game three than you lost in game one. So on the play in game one, you had 59% win rate. Uh, in game three, you have 56% win rate. On the draw, it was 57 and uh, it is 54.4 in on the draw in, in game three. Because in game one, you see all kinds of decks. In game three, you will play only against a deck that could be at least win one game with you. So you already discard quite a large chunk of um, of those maybe slightly weaker decks. So yeah, um, that's maybe interesting. Interesting to uh, to know when uh, you go to the game three, you're much less favored as a seventeen lens user than uh, than when you go to your game one. Uh, right. So now I'm going to talk about the best best of three cards. And um, I'm going to explain how I calculated this change in the performance. But basically, I took the win rate of each of those cards that you have on the list that I'm going to be talking in a second. Um, and I basically checked what is the relation of this card to the average win rate for the format. So if the average win rate in best of one was 54.5, if a card has 57.5, it's plus three percentage points from the average. And if it's uh, 52.5, it's minus two percentage points from the average. And I calculated that for every card and I calculated it from the both formats. So this way I can take account the difference between win rates between best of three and best of one uh, to some extent. And then I calculated the difference between those two numbers for the best of three and best of one. So, for example, the card that performs the best in best of three, uh, as opposed to best of one, is an offer you can't refuse. So it's 13 percentage points difference. The card is doing pretty badly in best of one, but in best of three, it's doing pretty well. So uh, the difference between 
how it does compared to the average of best of one and how it does compare to the average of best of three was massive. Now, obviously, you will quickly probably tell me that, yeah, because it's a sideboard card. Yeah, that's true. And I think that lots of the cards that do better in best of three are going to be cards that are used as sideboard cards. Um, so uh, keep that in mind. And also keep in mind that we are literally going to look at which cards are sideboard cards and how frequently there is in sideboard and actually if they are good sideboard cards in a second. Um, the second card is not on the list with also very impressive difference of 12.5 percentage points between best of three and best of one is bootlegger stash. And I have no idea why, honestly. Uh, number three is incriminate with seven percent, um, uh, seven percentage points difference uh, in favor of best of three. This card, I can give you a spoiler, is also a good sideboard card according to the data, at least. Which I found strange because I wouldn't play that card, but the numbers on it are decent, uh, so there must be some kind of a good application in sideboard. Uh, we have also incandescent area, the Jeskai, who Jeskai? What am I saying? Cabaretti, um, uh, deal free to every creature uh, that's not a token, kind of uh, semi-wrath, I guess. Um, again, this could be a card that is a sideboard one, but it also could be a card that, uh, you know, Cabaretti is slightly more viable in this format, and, uh, uh, and uh, because of that, it might be a better card, uh, because, well, because it was probably unplayable in the... Mm, so I see the chat is um, telling that maybe because best of three is slightly slower. And this is one thing I super regret. I was a bit too lazy to compare the speed of those two formats. Um, and unfortunately, maybe we can do it in the live on the, um, uh, during the, the question sessions and we can try to, oh no, but I will have to open my data set for the, for the best of one, which will take hours. No, no, we're not going to do it. Maybe I'll put it in Twitter thread, the speed of the format. But it is a very good suggestion that Bootlegger stash might be the one of those cards that is working very well when you um, when you um, have a slower format and best of three might be slightly slower because you won't have those explosive starts because there is no um, there is no hand smoothing. So yeah, that's the reason. And then we have Angel of Suffering. I think another card that might uh, benefit from slightly slower format. Obscura Interceptor, another card that might um, uh, benefit from slightly smaller format. All those cards are like five to six percentage points uh, better in best of three um, than in best of one compared to the baseline. Oh, that's a very good point MTG Diversity makes. Uh, would bootlegger slash reflect the fact that best of three drafters are better and thus more likely not run that card when it's skewed but not good in their deck? It's possible. Although we still talk about 17 lens users, uh, so it's arguable if uh, 17 lens users are better between best of three or best of one. I never uh, had any numbers that could confirm that because it's very hard to uh, to do it. But it might be that um, that the group of the 17 lens users in best of three that did play um, bootlegger stash were better players and they knew exactly when to use it. This is bootlegger stash is indeed one of those cards that will vary quite dramatically between the top tier players and the, and and the beginner players because they know it large part of success with those cards is to know when not to play it rather than when to play it and um lots of uh, beginner players they would just try to do it for science and it's good you know i mean i'm not saying that they shouldn't because that's how you become a better player, trying things, failing, and, and, and drawing conclusions from that. But players that are more experienced, they already went through that stage, so now they know exactly when not to play with Lager Stash. So I would tell you, look, if you have weird cards like that, it's a great experience um, uh, for you to learn something new. It will cost you gems, though. So uh, you pay gems to become a better player on some occasions, unfortunately. And we have a couple of... Uh, strange cards like endless detour uh, that's the thing that puts something on a permanent or, or spell on top of the library and errant street artist um that's thing that can copy casualty cards in in, in shortcut uh, uh in in short basically 
Um, again, this card might be better because of a slower format. Uh, you might actually get some of the casualty spells copied, um, unlike in best of one when you just don't have time to be cute with it because you're struggling for survival against another disciplined dualist. And we have a couple of um, um, uh, couple of Riveteers card, Ziatora's Envoy, Jetmir's Fixer, which is technically Gru, but will fit into this Riveteer uh, deck. They do better in this format. So um, it seems like Riveteers are slightly better in, um, in uh, best of three than in best of one. Um, you also get the Ziatora's Proving Ground and uh, Mr. Orfeo the Boulder. Uh, they are doing like four to three percentage point better. Uh, interesting, another interesting card. Obviously, Tavern Swindler, the hot um, hot topic of the recent weeks, uh, uh, whether it's good or not. I recommend you to listen uh, to the Mystical Dispute um, a podcast, which has a good discussion about Tavern Swindler. Um, Voidrend, another three color uh, card uh, that is. Um, uh, a removal. I, I guess that this is uh, yes, exactly. Uh, Springbok noticed that several of these cards are free color. So we got the Zeteras Envoy, Endless Detour, Obscure, Inter Obscure Interceptor, Incandescent Area. Uh, it might be that um, slightly slower games will make you more likely to reach free colors, even with slightly worse fixing. I'm preaching the gospel of make sure you have good fixing because you're going to lose more games through bad fixing than through the bad card quality when you're playing three colors. Because in three colors, you will get there. Hi, Mercurio. It's always it's going great. Thank you very much. Um, so maybe those slightly slower decks uh, in best of three, and we are basing it on nothing because I didn't do the maths there, uh, but uh, allegedly slightly slower decks in best of three will uh, promote you getting into those three colors and being able to play those cards. And you know those three color cards are three colors for a reason. They are on good rate. And if you can play them, then you gain some mana advantage, card advantage, whatnot. Um, uh, Mr. Scott Butt, Scott, Scottling Butler is also there. Uh, that's the, if I'm not mistaken, 4-1 uh, that gets double strike when you have a couple of multicolor permanents on board. Uh, this card is doing better by four percentage points, uh, so that's maybe interesting to see. And we have uh, Gala Greeters, which is does slightly better again, maybe maybe because Cabaretti and uh, Riveteers are slightly better. And uh, we have Broken Wings, and uh, this I would guess is um, because it is a sideboard card, and it does slightly better when it's put in game number two when you know that you have targets for it. So um, yeah. Uh, these are the cards that do better in best of three. Oh. Um, there are very few cards that uh, do worse in best of three. And weird ones are Cut of the Prophets and Arcane Bombardment. But here, I think the main reason for that is that the um, sample size was slightly smaller. So um, uh, uh, that was that was it. Uh, and we have like weird cards like Arc Splitter and Glittering Stockpile. These were not big sample sizes and also cards that were poor already and they're just slightly poorer in, in the best of three. Uh, we have Titan of Industry, which was slightly surprising, but it's pretty good in uh, best of one. So maybe um, it drops slightly just by pure... Um, Um, Metal Mario um, asking is make disappear is a little worse in best of three. It didn't come out from my data, but uh, my data is also looking at a particular uh, time frame. So maybe it will decrease more now because I'm looking only at the time frame between seventh and twenty third of May because that was the time frame that I could get from the uh, from the publicly available data, and I wanted to cut the first ten days so that I didn't catch those early days when people were figuring out. But cards like Make Disappear are becoming weaker as the format progresses because people just learn how to play around them. Uh, so maybe by now it, 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 it can be in, in, that, um, in that list. And we have a couple of uh, weird cards. One that I would like to draw your attention to is Extract the Truth. Um, that's the discard a creature or the opponent sacrifices an enchantment. That's worse in best of three than best of one. Um, and Rigo Streetwise Mentor, I assume that this is again the case of um, 
slight variance between those two cards. But maybe there is a reason for why Rigo is worse, because maybe in game two and three, when the opponent knows that it exists, they will hold that minus two, minus, minus three, minus three spell um, in their hand to target it, and it will not be as good. Um, Extracted Truth is the Florida Man special, yes. Um, yeah, Titan of Industry, I don't have an explanation for that. But no, no, I don't have an explanation for that. You, you, you don't always have to. Exp uh, that's the good part of the data. Sometimes you have an explanation. Sometimes you just say, look, I observed this. And um, please do with it whatever you please. I'm just passing you that observation. To my best knowledge, it can be variance or there can be a reason for, uh, for that being uh, poor. OK, so let's look at the sideboard cards. And my god, did I make this small print, didn't I? Um, so basically, to calculate. <laughs> uh, so there is Florida Man with his extract uh, the truth uh, uh, approach. So basically, to calculate which cards are sideboarded very often, I calculated the uh, rate of that card being in the deck uh, in uh, game one and then game two, uh, and 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 check the difference. So for example, what it means is that an offer you can't refuse is 4.4 times more likely to be in the deck or drawn in the in, in game two than in game one, which means that it will be more frequently in the deck in game two than in game one, which means that it was sideboarded in into those uh, into those decks. So uh, the the four cards. Oh, you might be surprised with the numbers then, Florida man. Um, when we look at the numbers, the, the, there are really mainly two sideboard cards in this format. And that's an offer you can refuse and broken wings, which are roughly a four times more likely to be in game two than in game one. Then we have some cards that are definitely sideboarded in at times. Um, and it's extract the truth um, and incriminate, for example, they are around 2.1, 1.8 times more likely to be in game two than in game one. And then we have a bunch of cards that are to my surprise, uh, a bit um, uh, slightly less sideboardable because uh, cards like Disdainful Stroke, uh, By Your Silence, they are like you know 30%, 40% more likely to be in game two than in game one. Same goes with the Daring Escape, uh, Weird Arcane Bombardment. I don't know why people sideboard that in, but okay. This one uh, maybe is also that Mythics will have a much smaller uh, sample size, so there might be some difference based on, uh, well, basically. Um, variants in there. Uh, we have Brass Knuckles as a sideboard card, I, and, and Most Wanted. These probably two, these two probably play the same kind of role um, where uh, uh, people play it against the decks that they think aggression might be useful. And um, weirdly, there's Unleash the Inferno, because I, I, I don't know, I mean, I would put it in my deck uh, uh, probably not at all costs, but if I can put it in my deck, I would put it in my deck in the first place. And not just sideboard it in. But OK, this one might be also because of the uh, variance or something. And there's also a high rise Sojak, which uh, is the rich creature. So I assume it's being sideboarded in against the heavy flyers deck. And Midnight Assassin. Uh, so yeah, again, slightly strange sideboard card. But I can see that being useful for some, some particular use, uses. So. Oh god, another another um, example of uh, bad graph making for me. But um, uh, I'm sorry, I had a, I had a super busy weekend. I maybe didn't put enough uh, uh, effort into beautification this week that I that I should have. But it's the same cards basically in the same exact order. And I looked at the win rates uh, of those cards between um, game one and game two. So an offer you can refuse, for example, it has a 62.5% win rate in uh, game one based on a very minuscule uh, sample size. So I don't know, there must have been something weird going on in there. Um, <clears throat> but it has a decent win rate um, in game two, so after sideboarding, which makes me think it is actually a good uh, sideboard card. It has a solid win rate. Um, and uh, the sample size in game two is much, much bigger than in game one, obviously. Um, so then I looked at um, uh, Broken Wings. It also has a slight improvement in terms of game win rate. 
it's um, uh, 53 percentage points, uh, 53 percent uh, win rate in, 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 in game one. Once you do sideboarding and you uh, decide that this would be good against this deck, it goes up to 55.1. So, yes, Shadowy si Shadow Side 7. Play an offer you can't refuse in every deck. In every deck. Just counter your own spells and you have two treasures for what for one mana plus whatever that other spell costs. Um, no, the, 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 the people that played the um, uh, offer you can refuse in game one was a very small sample size. I don't know, Jay John. I mean, it would be actually quite interesting from the point of view of magic psychology to look at whether they sideboard more frequently when they lost the first game or when then, <laughs> or, or, or do they do it with equal uh, frequency? So, um, Jay John 88 is asking if there's any possibility of some play draw stuff affecting the game one, um, game two data since some cards would come on the draw, I'd imagine, or some on the play. Um, I don't know. I didn't. I didn't. I didn't check it, but um, it would be interesting to check. That's a very good suggestion. You know, I never did an episode on the best of three, so this is a first trial in this particular case. And every time I'm doing something for the second time, I add some features because I know what what was missing. So I really do appreciate those kinds of insights from the chat um, because that's a very very good suggestion to look at um, whether it was sideboarded in on the player on the draw more frequently. Mm -hmm. um, Magic para paradiddle. Um, do you mind if I answer your question after, at the end of the seminar? I think we're just a couple of slides in, so um, maybe it will be like easier to do it um, uh, as a as a pre discussion at the end, if you don't mind. Um, now, extract the truth. Actually, is one of the cards that um, decreases its win rate in game two, uh, which is weird. But I mean. Here we have to keep in mind that m maybe the decks that sideboard it in are not as good as the decks that keep it in the main, so that the card really needs to give some thought. I don't want to, you know, um, talk bad things about this card in front of uh, Florida Man, uh, but of course um, uh, uh, it looks like at least um, in game two it doesn't perform as well as it did in the game one. It probably would be uh, better in this particular case to try to dig into. Um, um, uh, dig into um, the data that shows exactly what was the win rate when it was sideboarded in. But it's pretty hard to do because uh, you need to look at the differences between decks. Um, it's very painful, uh, painful to analyze. Um, okay. Basically, Florida Man is saying that stat line is me taking it out of my main and bad matchups. But then you won't see it because it won't be drawn in the uh, game two. So yeah, ah, okay, you took it out of the game. That that you, you're increasing it in the game one. Um, it's still it's still um, extract the truth is played twice more frequently um, in game two than in game one. So uh, so even though you you remove it, more people put it in. Uh, but yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, where did you do it, Florida man? It, was it also mystical dispute when you gave your case for the, uh, extract the truth? I think it was a very well-made argument. I definitely gained a lot of interest in that card after that. So I would recommend listening. Um, there is incriminate, which is a terrible card. It's the choose two target creatures. Um, uh, the opponent sacrifices one of them. Oh, God, yeah. Okay, hide, 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 hide. Um, incriminate, which performs roughly the same um, in game one and in game two, but it's sideboarded in frequently. So um, some people think it works. I wouldn't play that card. So uh, um, so I don't know. Um, and then we have the cards that are sometimes uh, sideboarded. So of course, if those cards are sideboarded quite rarely, um, the signal... Um, of those cards will be um, rather low uh, because only few of the games that uh, were played in game number two are the ones where they were sideboarded. 
like here, you know, we had almost four and a half times more games in the uh, as game two and then game one. Here we will only have 20% or so uh, difference. But one interesting thing is that um, brass knuckles do slightly better in the game too. So um, it will be interesting to uh, uh, dig a bit deeper and try to figure out why that would be so. Um, and for the other cards, you don't see any kind of significant trend. I mean, Arcane Bombardment, I told you it's a weird one. It has still an awful win rate, which is sad because, you know, one of the few build arounds in this format that would be interesting, but it's at mythic and, and, and non feasible. Uh, by, by your silence has decent numbers in game two. So maybe, you know, sometimes when you have low on interaction deck and you need to deal with some kind of weird bomb, uh, oh, uh, you might want to put it in and it, that the numbers show that it actually is, is not bad at all. Um, yeah, that's more or less it. Um, other cards don't show anything too interesting. So with that, I would like to thank 17 Lands team with Viral Misnomer, first and foremost, uh, Hululu Grantwu, uh, ZTM, aka Alebalini. So, um, yeah, thanks to them for running 17 Lands and uh, helping a uh, person like me to get their content on track by, uh, by providing them providing me with all the data that I basically need. So uh, that's awesome. And also I would like to thank, thank fake Jake Brown uh, for help with releasing that in the form of a podcast. And while we're at it, I would also like to thank uh, SSQ and uh, Mana Junkie for the music that we use in the podcast episode um, versions. And with that, I'll see you next week.